Good morning. On the third day of the We Make the City Festival. And welcome in Pakhuis des Weiger. My name is Charlotte Schans. I'll be the moderator for today. And we're here at the third day of, of the We Make the City Festival to speak about common ground. And it's about the common ground in co-creation. Last year we were here with uh, lots of uh, pioneering city makers, pioneering uh, eldermen, vice mayors from all over Europe and around the world to speak about co-creation. And uh, we felt the need that we need to talk about this issue a bit more and to go a bit more in depth of some of the systemic changes that we touched upon last year. So this year we will uh, talk about how can co-creation serve an inclusive city that benefits all, which, which is of course the theme of this year's We Make the City Festival. And um, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the systemic changes that are necessary for this shift to take place. So we're going to go into power, we're going to go into finance, and we're going to go into bureaucracy today. And uh, it's, it's super fun for, you, for those of you who didn't realize, but at this moment there are um, a lot of different things happening throughout the city. Uh, in total, we make the City Festival hosts 500 lectures, workshops, activities, events trainings throughout the whole city of Amsterdam and um, they all are about the fact that we together should be tackling the urban challenges but this is the one that we're, we, we will be speaking about how to actually do that and how to tackle these systemic changes that are necessary for we make the city to thrive. So we're going to have a challenging program this morning. Um, we're going to have three panels on those three systemic changes that I just men men uh, mentioned, power, finance and bureaucracy. And we're going to do that with uh, some of the best and brightest minds out there and some of the doers and thinkers that are trying to change the system uh, on, on a daily basis. Uh, but in this afternoon you'll have a chance to dig a little bit deeper into those systemic changes by the, a series of workshops. So this morning is going to be quite high paced, quite short presentations, lots of content. But this afternoon after lunch everybody goes out into their workshops and then we get to work and actually uh, talk about it and work on these, uh, these challenges. So um, I hope you'll bear with us because there won't be a lot of uh, space for discussion this morning with all of you, but there will be this, uh, this afternoon. Um, so the first panel that I want to announce uh, this morning is that we're going to talk about the power of the people. And the first person that I want to bring forward is Laura Sobral, all the way from Sao Paulo. And she wrote an excellent book about cooperation tools on governance from the European continent. So as a Brazilian, she studied uh, some of the good governance tools. And I uh, would love her to present a little bit of the findings from the book. Can you come forward? Laura Sobral. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation for being here. And I'll start with uh, the story of the square in Sao Paulo, Brazil, because it was where everything started. Um, this square is 28,000 square meters. It's uh, quite in the downtown. I mean, it's just, for us, it's five kilometers from downtown, so it's close. Um, yeah, and it was kind of uh, being rebuilt for more than 10 years, and when they finished, it was basically that. You see, like, no trees, no urban furniture, not, uh, well, anything. So, uh, me and some other friends, we decided to go there every week to create um, an identity for the place and start occupying and thinking about how was the process and how can we change it. We called uh, the potato needs you because the name of the square is Largo da Batata, which means pot potato square, kind of. Uh, so uh, we've done weekly meetings for 1.5 years, one, more than 100 meetings. Uh, and we were kind of uh, building um, street furniture, having cultural activities, talks, and well, mainly occupying the square, making it uh, lively. After more or less one, one year and a half, we had something like that. And I think the most important thing you can see here, it's people. So uh, people are actually using the square. It's a very busy square, but uh, it had just passing, people just passing by, I think around more than 20,000 people a day. And now people were able to rest and exchange. So um, it happened in one year and a half, more than 20,000 people were involved. 
Um, we had an online website, we had a shared calendar, we had, well, many things. And after this one year and a half, um, we had elections again for mayor. We did all that in the square without asking for permission because we, uh, our point was that we were making uh, a creative use of the space, we were not making an event. But uh, the municipality was quite um, open to dialogue, even though they were not 100% happy. They were not uh, willing to, um, to resist or fight or anything, so uh, we were talking. And we didn't know how would be the next mayor of the city. So, I mean, Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is the city, uh, which is the city I'm talking about. Um, in there we have a lack of citizen culture. We had dictatorship for many years. I'm the first generation without dictatorship. So the fact of like, just meeting outside and having fun and exchanging is nothing uh, natural there. So we're kind of relearning to occupy the space, just using that collectively. Um, of course, we have lack of political stability. It's very hard to make things that resist the political cycles and they, that they are rooted in the um, civil society. And we have lack of social, of financial resources for this kind of social actions. Um, so what we started to do is to search for cooperative tools that could help us, um, not just us, but just uh, another, um, at that time, it was 2014, 2015, uh, the city were, were, was having like many initiatives like this, kind of reclaiming the city, like urban gardens, people occupying squares, uh, people taking care uh, of parks. So uh, these movements started to think about cooper cooperative tools that could uh, be make the, these movements more sustainable and be, and be able to develop without um, while well, depending on, on the politicians. So um, the point would be like to, to, to turn public space into common public space. And uh, also to uh, deepen the idea of participation, not about uh, talking, that we have, of course, this kind of uh, citizen councils, but um, some tools and legal frameworks and so on that would make, make us able to do things together um, and actually act um, in the city. So um, that's why I came to Europe, invited by the German government to, um, to research some, some of these uh, cooperative tools that are here in Europe. So I did study for the last two years based in Berlin, but I studied the BIPs in Lisbon, the Bologna regulation in Italy, and the public social cooperation, cooperation ordinance in Madrid. They all have um, public policies that help this uh, citizens initiative to be able to like prototype co-governance, hyper-local uh, models that uh, are agreement-based, so it's about kind of the, the public administration do, do, can do like this and that, and the citizens can do this and that, so they make an agreement like who do what, and they can really cooperate towards the improvement of public spaces, for example. Uh, so I'm talking very briefly about the BIPZIP strategy in Lisbon. So uh, it's based uh, basically in the, um, in the funding, which is um, 5,000 euros per project per year. So they have, um, I think, 6% of the housing um, budget, uh, the, the, the housing department budget. It goes to the BBZ program. So um, they, through this open calls for this, funding program, they identify the local resources so they could, they, they were able to find uh, which are the um, citizens' initiatives that are, were doing something uh, for uh, the improvement of public space. Sometimes it's just like a mobile, sometimes it's a mobile um, library, sometimes it's just, it's really like a gardening activity, sometimes it's engaging employ, unemployed people in some community action, sometimes it's really 
kind of uh, transforming the square, uh, a square physically. And so this way they support micro innovation co-governance. And um, they also have the GABIPs, which is part of the BIPZIP strategy, which are, um, okay, which are, <laughs> which are um, local offices that like, they, they, they work as a fast track between the administration and the citizens. And they are, they are, um, they are present in the territories of which, which with more beep zip projects, like they're just normally vulnerable neighborhoods. So this is the Bologna regulation. The Bologna regulation is about uh, basically creating a legal framework uh, that make this kind of agreements possible. Um, with this, of course, they support micro innovation and they identify also local resources. Um, well, the initiatives actually ask them to develop something like that. And Madrid is really <laughs> complete. Uh, so they have everything started with an online platform of participatory budgeting and crowd law. And through that, they could already kind of finance some smaller projects, or some, some, sometimes it's not that small. Um, so then they complemented with um, also a legal framework, organizing all the, all the ways that you have to collaborate with the um, public administration, you being a citizen. And uh, they also have spaces for collective building, like one per district. So it's 32 local forums where people can uh, participate offline and also kind of build collective um, projects. It was very, very quick, but I would like to thank you. Uh, there is more detail about all these um, cooperative tools in the book. It's free for downloading. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Laura. So please have a seat here when we go over to the next speaker. So can I uh, ask to come forward uh, Manu Klaas? So he's the chairman of the Antwerp Citizen uh, Movement Strata Generaal and he will tell us all about it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a recent co-creation process that we established in Antwerp, city of Antwerp in Belgium. But first some context. Um, things don't go, don't go well with uh, democracy. The Eurobarometer uh, tells us that since 1992, but also recent research, uh, for example in France, tells us that people lose trust in democracy. There's a, an increasing distrust, uh, and especially among young people, look to the left, young people, uh, less than 35 years in France, half of the young people think that it's time for something else, perhaps some more autocracy things. At the same time, 20 years ago, the Battle of Seattle, the outer globalists, they asked for a different direction. They asked for more say, for more what we call medezeggenschap in Dutch. That same year, Strate General was established in Antwerp, and we had the same feeling, but then on a local level. We wanted to have more say. And we worked around uh, four concepts, um, which is resistance study, network, and fieldwork. I'm going to go through that uh, just to illustrate it a little bit. In uh, 2005, the Flemish government decided that they wanted to build a huge flyover through the city of Antwerp with 18 lanes. We said, this is good for Los Angeles, but it is, this is not a good idea for the city of Antwerp. At the same time, we had a huge traffic jam problem, so things had to happen. Um, and we had a referendum about that four years later. The people of Antwerp uh, voted no, so this flyover thing was uh, uh, abolished. Um, we proposed alternatives, so we said, uh, we, we, we studied, we, we, we made uh, visions for the future with a lot of people, we organized uh, co conferences about different ways of building highways, stuff like that. So that's the study part. Networking, you see Strata General to the left, to the right, there's another group called Ademlos, which is breathless, 
and they were focusing on the air quality in Antwerp. And around us, there was like a cluster of a lot of people, uh, as existing uh, movements, new movements, small uh, cultural places. They all joined. So, and we formed a huge network in the city of Antwerp. And then field work that's just going out in the street, uh, information, uh, petitions, uh, organizing stuff with people on all kinds of levels. Uh, and this is a, a normal info evening for us. There's like 400, 500 people coming just to participate. Um, February 2014, a third play player came. So there was Strate General Ademlos. Here? Yeah, okay, that's better. It's, this is better? This sounds better? Okay, thank you. Um, a third partner came, Ring, uh, Ringland, and they proposed to put a cap on the whole ring. So like 12 kilometers of ring road around Antwerp, the proposition was to put a huge cap on the, on the ring road. And they, they also went through these study, fieldwork, network things. They proposed uh, with a lot of experts that on a voluntary basis joined their forces. Uh, and all kinds of things happened in the city of Antwerp. Um, every, during one month, every day, uh, a different group in Antwerp planted the flag. That could be a school, could be the local Boy Scouts, could be all kinds of uh, uh, diverse, very groups uh, that came to join it. Um, we organized uh, a, a, a march through the city of Antwerp. We called it Stappen om te overkappen. It's untranslatable, but it's something like we, we marched to, for a cap. Um, lots of people came. Uh, this was a huge movement at the time. Uh, people, this is uh, another presentation day. We had to organize two of them because there were too many people who wanted to come. And of course, the politicians see that. So in December 2015, the Minister of Mobility said, OK, I understand the message. We have to do something about this. This flyover thing is gone. We're going to start a co-creation process. And we appointed uh, what we call a superintendent, uh, a professor from MIT. He's a, a Belgian also. He came to Antwerp. He got a contract for two years. And he started a very intricate process. I'm going to explain this process. But one of the things is that it was uh, the minister president of Flanders is in the middle there, the mayor of Antwerp is there, the different civil citizen movements, all kinds of ministers, huge press uh, things to start this process. So that was one of the things that we had. There was such a political interest in those things that um, we, we could really have a, a, a jump start. Um, we, we think it's the most ambitious citizen participation process happening in, in Belgium right now uh, because, and I'm going to explain you why, because it's, uh, we have established a working community where people from bureaucracy, so the administration, people from the, that have expertise and people from the citizen movements join on an equal level. So there's no politicians involved, there's the, the bureaucracy experts, experts from the citizen movements, other experts that are appointed by government, they all join forces and we work on very specific cases. Like for example, there's a workbench on modal shift. How are we going to lower the impact of the car? There's a, a, a workbench on capping the ring road, a workbench on, on this uh, flyover alternative and all kinds of, of high level workbenches. The golden triangle is the administration, expert and citizens and they are joined once in a while by business community and public companies. And it's a long term uh, engagement by the government. Um, it's a deep thing, uh, which means that uh, the process architecture, the, the people from the administration, the people from the citizen movements and the experts have to find a different role for themselves that from what they used to. Uh, and there's a lot of budget there. So the government says, OK, we have to have uh, the budgets. Um, the same day that we established this Toekomstverband with uh, the Covenant for the Future with the government, I read a review of an interesting book uh, in The Guardian on an octopus. Um, and this octopus model was uh, helpful for me because I was thinking at that time about eight different roles of uh, political citizenship. You have the activism part, but uh, there's more than activism. Activism, that's uh, all kinds of uh, roles that you can have. But we need to get, as citizens, we need to get inside the system as well. So the government has to establish procedures so that, let's say, activists, citizen movements can join the procedures that prepares a policy. And that's the thing that has happened in Antwerp, so that we know the normal activism things, the pioneering, being a dissident, talking about it. Um, we see that all successful citizen movements have gone through that. There's some examples there. Um, 
What we have done in Antwerp is during and within policy making, we become part of the process. You can do that in different shapes. You can be a citizen as a deliberator, like in citizen panels, well, like what they did in Ireland on the abortion question. Uh, you can be a citizen as a voter, of course, but not only to go to elections, but also for a referendum. In Antwerp, we are citizens as stakeholders. We have an interest. We join the civil servants and the experts to work in workbenches. Uh, these are some slides from these workbenches in all kinds of different shapes. Um, yeah, high level and low level, uh, broad and small. Uh, last year, the first results for the Covenant of, of the Future were established. The government decided to make sure that there was 1.25 billion euros for the first 18 strategic projects, and they were all made by these workbenches. So that was an interesting thing. I think that the system of workbenches can also be established or can be applicable in other fields, not only in this kind of uh, let's say, our urban infrastructure discussion, but also, for example, in climate, for example, on climate uh, or, or on social housing, on, on wherever. The expertise of citizen movements is very high uh, and the civil servants are happy that, sometimes are happy that they are joined by that expertise. Um, and then lately I wrote a book on uh, um, explaining that we can use this process for the climate change uh, challenge as well. Um, and on, on all these different things that have happened in Antwerp and on these octopus eight arms and whatever, uh, I read a book uh, which is called Safe Democracy and uh, I, uh, I explain what this octopus model is about. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Manu, and uh, you can both take the stage after the second presentation. So, and then can I ask forward uh, to come with me Mike Brandjes, community organizer from the Amsterdam-based Kaabuurt, who will also tell us a little bit about a participation strike that recently happened. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Are you still awake? Yeah. You see a picture there? of people, because that's the most important asset that we have in the K-Zone. And for those of you who don't know Amsterdam very well, K-Zone is that little blue dot there. And as you can see, there's Amsterdam, then there's a little bit of something else, and then we are in a separate enclave. Now, why that's important, come up in a minute. But our main lifeline is a metro line. You'll probably take it if you come to our session this afternoon. So, we call ourselves 1104 to our postcode. People have a real pride, Quattro, for their postcode, for their area. And that's real nice, and we use that. It used to be real uh, buildings in the 70s, uh, completely the projects, uh, as it was called uh, then, it, was called, it, it became the projects like you know it in the States. A lot of this was demolished. Uh, some of it remains. It's called K-Zone, because all the flats start with a K, and we organize ourselves around the communities in those flats and those areas. But the buildings are not the main thing. It's the people that are the main thing. So here you see a picture of in our own headquarters, so to say, um, of what's happening there. We live with lots of people from abroad who do their thing and do it in different ways. And it's a very eclectic mix. Um, what we do as heart of the K-Zone by now we do many more things than what you refer to, which I'll come to in a minute. But for example, here on the left, you see a notice about garbage collection. Most people can read it, but in my area, a lot of people are illiterate. They have no clue. It's just a number of letters and some, 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 some colors. So what we do is we change that, we picturize it, and now the government actually puts those notices and the garbage collection. So we're really trying to reinvigorate the neighborhood and make it better for the people there. We create what we call every weekly gatherings for people who want to get involved. And one of the things is that Metro that I talked about, they wanted to cut it two years ago. They wanted to put a stop and then we would forever be behind uh, an overstop. And so, can we show the, the movie? So that's how we saved our metro line. 
But every time, from somewhere, some plans come and get put onto us, the citizens. We don't know where this all starts and who gets these ideas, but every time you're up against something. So heart of the K-Zone, we really started with this one. This is that metro station, around that you see a red circle. It's where we now have a square, but these were the building plans. We would have no longer a community square. So the community stood on the square and we formed the heart. We said, we want a heart for our neighborhood. And we demonstrated with love. And lo and behold, we got it. Lo and behold, the politician said, yes, you will get your square. But what we also got was what in Dutch they call a participation trajectory. You are taken into a trajectory where you can talk to professionals what you want, and they actually hired an expensive communication agency to do all of that. And one of the sessions you see here. And if you compare this picture to the picture that I showed you earlier, the colorful picture with the Ghanaians, you see that something is wrong. And why is this? It's only white folks like me, older, well-educated. This does not fit the K-zone. So we said, this can no longer happen. You have to also remember that in Southeast, a lot of immigrants came in the 70s. The civil servants, they really do their best, but they feel they are the parents and we are the children. By now, the children have grown up. But that culture still permeates everything. And so, there were plans developed, but they were not our plans. And we could vote in the end of this participatory trajectory on two options. But none of those two options were really our options. So we said, we go on strike. We no longer vote. Stop it. So we had a participation strike. This happened just before the municipality elections. So it was good timing and it really made an impact. The strike was very successful. Out of 15,000 people in the neighborhood, only 200 put something in for a vote. So it's a very low number. And so things changed. And now everything is back to square one. Now we can make the plans and we can develop our own plans and everything is back to square. But I want to show you some things that we take away from this. Myself, I come from the very front of society and I have fallen on some of these dimensions to the very back. And it's been a revelation. I live in one of the smallest social housing in Amsterdam. But I live with people that are really people. But what you see is that there are strong people that have lots of capital on all sorts of dimensions, and there's people at the fringe. And like you saw in the picture, we really live in the fringe of Amsterdam. And what you see is that people from the government, they often ask, what do you want, citizens? So it's like an angling, and they want to catch something up. But what it does, they then try to get more people to come, but it's always the strong people that come. Because there's a self-selecting mechanism in who turns up. Whereas the people at the fringe, you need to use their key unlockers. You need to enhance their organizational stuff. So we have found a different way. Broad listening, deep listening, self-organizing the communities, and total transparency. Last year we got 610,000 euros in our neighborhood and for physical improvements. The civil servants had already made plans how to divide that. We said stop, now we want to do it ourselves. And we did as a community. We went into the neighborhood and together with the neighborhood and the experts and everyone else, we divided that 610,000 budget. So this is what we currently do as Heart for the K-Zone. We work for the physical improvement, for inclusive area improvement, economic, social, and durable. We are working to change the bureaucracy bottom-up and for self-organization. We do it with a real nice team. And as a final, this is about the power, this section. What we see is that there is a government, much in the past has been gone to the market, um, but now it's time for things to go to citizens' initiatives. The government is, is everything equal, is everything legal. There's efficiency, but we, what we can do is effectiveness. But this is a power struggle that really is going on and is not going by itself. What you see in the movie of the Metro, that's what helps. But we need more structures and more power to go to the people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Please have a seat. Manu and Laura, please come back with me. 
So thank you so much because these these were all super impressive stories, both uh, Laura reflecting from your personal uh, reasoning behind the research that you've done and, and the experience you both gained in, in Antwerp and Amsterdam. Um, I really liked the notion of uh, what Laura said about the permeable system. Uh, and I was wondering if you can reflect about, because all your practices, they, they try in a way to open up a system and make them a little bit more permeable. Can you reflect from your experiences? Like how do you, how do you view that and what are your hopes for the future? Well, one of the reasons why government in Antwerp and in Flanders was so willing to work with us was uh, an alternative for this participation strike. We went to court uh, to make sure that everything was blocked. So this was, we started from the same situation. Nothing could happen, we couldn't go forward or backward. And from there on, we have established uh, uh, new ways. Uh, and I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by what has, what's happening in the Cape Boot, and especially I, I see some links about self-organization of people and changing bureaucracy at the same time. It's like, it has to go back and forward. And we feel that, in, that bureaucracy in Antwerp is ready to change themselves. And from that, from there, uh, this, uh, how, you, how do you call it, permeation of, uh, there's, more, there's more willingness to, to accept broader information coming up from the bottom. But uh, it's, it's most important thing is that bureaucracy uh, gets a new framework to change, so that, for example, this market becomes uh, much smaller. And do you want to reflect on it as well, the permeability of the system? Um, yeah, I think the whole point is um, the government should be kind of everyone, and uh, I think that nowadays things are very separate, like what government wants, it's not exactly what people want, like how can you make this really representative, how can you uh, collaborate directly and understand that these people are there to make something that people should, would, should uh, like to, should wish for. So uh, I, the point of being permeable is just kind of how can you really cooperate with people understanding that you are del you're delivering public services for the people that really uh, will be the users of it. So um, kind of just like think, bring things uh, closer together and not separate uh, the way it's today. So Mike, you, you stepped over it quite quickly, but probably it wasn't the easiest to, to, to achieve that something that was meant to be spent through the, the, through the systems of the, of, the, of the government was actually handed over to you, the, the financial resources to the, to the movement in the Kabuurt. Can you explain us how, how you made sure that, that that happened a little bit? Like how, what kind of negotiations went and by the way, we didn't get the 610,000. They were not rich. It was just that money in the bank at the government. We just decide if it gets spent on a playground or on improvements uh, for lights. That, that Participatory kind of budgeting yeah. in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it, 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 to get that budget was at that moment no longer very difficult because we had made cases before and shown our teeth. I think that made a real big difference. And I think they also saw that we were not just against. We were builders. We just hadn't had the opportunity to build yet. And so I think that the team that we had a strike against, the civil servant team, uh, of course they were at that time completely shocked. But we went through shock therapy together. We had the HVA do some research and say, hey, these citizens, they were right. And they made a complete turn. A complete turn, and now we have the best of interaction and relation with that same civil servant team. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think one important thing is about co-implementation, right? Because I mean, people, uh, the idea of participation, and then you just uh, then the government they implement the way they they, they translate it. I don't think that's enough for today. I think people want to really do it together. Mm -hmm. yeah, also. Coincidentally, the title of your book, Doing It Together, right? <laughs> this is beyond participation almost. Yeah, co-creation, what we're talking about today. Manu? Yeah, the, one of the reasons why we got stuck is that we worked in the classical procedure of civil servants making plans for the, el the elected government, and they had the expertise in an inside and outside, and that made like a very high-bro, logical plan that was logical for a certain group of people. 
And then with the superintendent coming to Antwerp, so this election of like what we call an intermediary figure, Bemiddelaar, who had also some expertise, the, the whole architecture changed. And he also has a, partic a participation bureau with him. Um, and we organized uh, high-level meetings with a, a lot of technical expertise. You also have to know that some discussions about infrastructure are really difficult. Uh, and then also uh, in, in the neighborhoods, uh, lots of discussions. And it was, the challenge was to combine what came out of the neighborhoods with this high-level technical discussions where citizen movements were also involved. So we also had to get outside of, of our own, let's say, nutshell, our own, uh, well, white, white middle class uh, yeah, so yeah, absolutely, because it was actually the next question for you, for all of you. Um, we're talking about sort of the, the, the relation between, on the one hand, systemic change, and on the other hand, like keeping thresholds uh, low enough to keep these processes uh, inclusive. And I think this is also the most difficult, for like, at least I think it's one of the most difficult things to make sure that sometimes a super technical discussion can be decided on by people that, have, that, that maybe lack that knowledge. So how do you make sure that these processes be, remain inclusive, Mike? Um, yeah, there, there's two real big, there's a number of uh, hurdles, but I'll, I'll mention two that are really, really big for us. One is that on that picture where you saw on the uh, top right hand corner, the strong, the elite, which probably all of us here are in that category. Our frame of reference is so dominant that we often don't understand what it is to live in the fringe. And the perspective is so different. And I think that we all feel we're doing really good things for people, but the people there have a completely different frame of reference. We all live in bubbles, and that debubbling is the incredible challenge that we have. The other thing is, uh, so that's the system. We fight against the system also, but there's another thing. It's not just the system. It's also the mindset of the people themselves that we're fighting against. Like you said, you know, people are taught to think small. Now suddenly they're taught that they can actually change the world and design their own square. People don't believe it. Mm -hmm. And that's also a big challenge for us to change the mindset of the people themselves. So it's also regaining trust in, your, in the capacities that you have to change the city. You want to reflect on it? Um, I think it's related also to like decolonizing our thought. I mean, um, if you identify some groups, they have very specific ways of participating. I mean, bringing young people is not that easy. Or uh, most vulnerable people, how can you communicate and translate what they want to the square, for example, for a square? So, I mean, if you use kind of prototyping and drawing and different t times of the day and also trying to you know, just like not do the things the way you, you're you used to do it. I think it's a good way to reflect when you have like so many layers and then you can, um, you can reflect together with the people how to how to find a way. I think it's, it's slow and it's not easy, but I can see a really, uh, a way which is inclusive and it's super fast and quick. I think it's, uh, it's complex and it should be, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I tell two uh, small anecdotes about this, uh, cap, putting a cap on the, on the ring road. Uh, there's design teams, professional teams that go into the neighborhoods to work with the people from sec section to section on how are we going to organize this cap and how are we going to join neighborhoods because that's the challenge. Uh, in one of the northern sections, they organized uh, classic information evenings, nobody showed up because it was the, uh, a K-zone uh, neighborhood. And then they decide, okay, we, we go to the supermarket. We, we, during the day, we go to the supermarket at the entrance and we see what happens. We, we won't, won't work with maquettes and whatever. We want, we want different things. And another anecdote is in the same zone, on the left side of the ring road, it's, uh, let's say, a, a poor, diverse, very challenging neighborhood. On the right side, it's like a, an upper middle class neighborhood. This upper middle class neighborhood did not want a cap on the ring. <laughs> because they said we don't want those other people coming to our neighborhood. And because of this whole process, and that's what you need the high level for, because of this whole process, government said we won't listen to this neighborhood because this is the whole city is so enthusiastic about this cap. We will not decide to put a cap on certain sections and other sections not. It's for the whole city. So this, this voice with petitions, with lots of people signing against the cap, they were just ignored because the government was supported by the whole movement in the city and the architecture that they established. So it's helpful for them as well. 
Great. Thank you so much for sharing this and also sharing your learnings with us. This afternoon we'll have the opportunity to go much more in depth with all of you uh, in the workshops. So uh, we'll be seeing you later and thank you so much for now. So I guess it's amazing to see that we've, we've already chatted a bit about how to make those power systems a bit more permeable. Um, and I think one of the, the other big issues on the table is how to make it financially uh, sustainable and how to uh, make the financial system a bit more inclusive to the, these new types of practices. So that is what the next panel is going to be about. So I would love to see step forward Indy Joar. Please come with me. He's an architect and uh, the co-founder of Zero Zero, and also uh, the senior innovation associate at Young Foundation, Good Growth by Design Advocate for the Mayor of London, and also uh, the founder of Dark Matter Labs. Can you please take us along uh, your beautiful presentation? Thank you. Indy Joar. Hello. Um, I'm going to try to make this quick. There's a lot to go through in about 10 minutes. So. Um, so maybe some of you sp uh, heard me speak on uh, on um, at the opening session on on the nature of the scale of the transition. What I'm going to focus very quickly on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the need. I think the need is very evident and clear. And I think uh, the one thing I would add to this conversation is that. Um, the type of conversation. So I'm going to talk about civic in a much bigger way than I think in just project sense. Um, I'm talking about it in a great transition sense, that the scale of the transition we're operating in is not going to be fixed by the market and, and private sector actors. I think what we're talking about is Marshall Plan scale interventions to drive the transition of our places and cities. That is a scale of conversation that I think we should be having in order to, to actually talk about decarbonizing and dealing with the economic transition that we're in the middle of. So that's just my context that I want to frame this conversation in. At the same time, I want to put this conversation into kind of what I would talk about is emerging absurdities. So in that conversation, we often talk about hunting unicorns. You probably heard me use the phrase. So in a moment when we're pretty much talking about massive global transformation, the focus is on how do we build billion dollar startups. At the same time, what you have is something called social investment, which many of you will heard of and everyone will be directing everyone towards. Why don't we have more social investment? Because this is a good thing. Well, you see that big, big, big blue thing? That's a UK welfare budget. Do you see that little dot? That's the largest social investment fund uh, in the world. 600 million. Uh, just to put that into context, the UK buys more ice cream in a year um, than all of that biggest social investment fund in the world. So, uh, so just to put the kind of scale of things in conversation, social investment has been typically used at edge of market transitions, small scale interventions at the edge of the dominant landscape. Actually, the problem that we face is that that's the problem. The problem is the middle, and it's a scale of money is nowhere near appropriate. At the same time, one of the big things that we've understood is that, and this is, I think, really important for the work that I think many of us are doing, is that common good, right, social projects create spillover value. This is, I know it's slightly technical. So common things create value which spills over. So they don't, so if you invest in a school, the school doesn't make you any money, right? The school's not going to make you money. But school creates huge amounts of positive value for the housing adjacent to it, for the economies in this, uh, around it, for the corporations around it, and the tax system around it. So the school doesn't create you value. What create, it spills over value. It's a generator of value in itself, but isn't a monetary system. So when you look at it, we have to see social projects from this perspective. And the problem is, increasingly, we're trying to make everything is a cost. So we, that's why we also see all of our social welfare is deemed a cost. What's a cost to society? And actually, the biggest, best, most interest is to see welfare as an investment which is unlocked and captured by all other systems. So that's really worth as a frame. Welfare is not a cost. Welfare is a strategic societal investment to unlock value. And it creates spillover value. Now, there's a reason why I'm setting this ground. Then the other part of the conversation goes back into this kind of scale of the challenge that we're sitting in. I'm going to move this quickly forward. But 
And the, the next part of the conversation is that our existing financial systems and our ability to financial instruments are relatively short term. They're all focused on silos, single point investment. I invest in the school, I want the money back from the school. It's like, well, school's not going to give you money. Um, you know, so, and they're largely opo uh, opaque, and they're largely centralized. So what we're seeing is capital concentration in the hands of the few. We see the reports are, are, are out, out right now. It's extraordinary, the con concentration of capital that we're seeing. Now, that sets up a really interesting question. One, systems challenges. So if you want to improve educational attainment in a city, the first thing you recognize is schools are only one-point intervention. You recognize prenatal nutrition, postnatal nutrition, participatory culture, a whole bunch of interventions are necessary in driving change. So if you want to, in a city to change educational attainment, everyone will go, let's do a social project around a product. It's not going to do the outcome. You need 20 to 40 different interventions to drive that thesis. And we know this. So if you look at some of the stats, it's extraordinary. So poverty, poverty drives actually a drop in IQ to everyone. Right, if I put you under financial stress, actually your ability to think complex thoughts is actually reduced. We know this, and you can go to air pollution, the impacts of it. So you start to very quickly realize that the drivers of the issues that we're trying to deal with are mul multiple and complex. Now, I'm gonna just keep flicking through because I wanna get through some stuff here. Um, and what you start, this is some work that we've been doing in Birmingham with uh, Amy Call's team around the system drivers of, of childhood, uh, childhood outcomes. And you can start to see there's 50 to 60 different interventions you could do. Increasingly, that's, this is another point that I think um, um, Charlie, uh, Ch uh, Char um, Charles will lead on, I think, also, is that innovation has to be diagonal. You have to go from policy all the way up to new products. So if you exist, operate in the existing democrat um, bureaucratic domain, you won't be able to innovate. But that, I'll talk about that later. This is an example of interventions. So we're not talking about one project. How do you build 20 different projects working together? right? And how do you support collaborative innovation across multiple organizations? That means you cannot write a central strategy. If you want to talk, talk about obesity, there is no central strategy for obesity because what you have to do is enable multiple people to do experiments and collaboratively learn and collaboratively share. Historically, we go to a public management theory on this, which is some central person will write a, a strategy and go, this is the strategy. Unfortunately, that's not how complex systems work. So you have to build capacity for innovation, which is decentralized. Rise of new civics. Now, this is important, right? This, is, this point is key. A lot of our thesis is based on actually either what I would say is hiding the problem, not ignoring it. The next part of the problem is addressing. So, if you're homeless in pretty much Western Europe, it costs about 38,000 euros. And that's largely in actually A&E costs, accident and emergency and hospital care costs. It's 38,000 a year if you're homeless in Western Europe, pretty much, uh, it's about 44,000 in parts of Europe, but it's in that region, uh, if you take, take the Scandix as well. Now, there's two ways of dealing with that. You can either say, let's deal with that cost, in which case it's cheaper to give everyone a home, it's factually cheaper, but we do know the home is not enough, right? We know there's all sorts of support services required that are actually still, but it's still cheaper. Right? So if you were to look at where that cost is allocated, it's currently allocated to A&E, it's still cheaper just to give people services, it's still significantly cheaper. The reason why we don't do it is all bunch of political issues about how we do prevention and other things. Second thing is you can look at is, is how, what would happen if you were to release the capacity of that person? So if that person was now able to have a house but actually actively contribute to society, what would be the value of that person contributing to society? So now you're not no longer just talking about the prevention of that spend, you're talking about actually the unlocking of that individual person. They're thriving. What is the value of that? And the third component is, um, I don't know the, the Dutch healthcare system, but I assume it's relatively public, right? So you guys are, this is a public healthcare system. How many of you made use of your public Public healthcare, healthcare system this week. Put your hands up, please. One, two. Every one of your hands should be up. Should I tell you why? Because you all knew it was there. Right? If you didn't know it was all there, you would be acting and behaving differently. Right? So everyone, don't fall into this services bullshit. It's not a service, it's a collective infrastructure which you're always relying on because it psychologically gives you resilience to actually take risks and take part in life that you would otherwise not do. 
right? So, and this is a percentage level game. So it unlocks, so what welfare systems do is they create the infrastructure for societal risk absorption in a way that we would never do. And this is important because what's the value of that? Right? And so when you look at actually how we talk about public goods and social goods, we have to see it at multiple levels of intervention. I think it's really important. Now, here is where it gets interesting. Financing, pure financing conversations. So uh, I will just jump to this. So the High Line in New York is a really brilliant example of civic goods in action. High Line in New York cost $278 million. 70% of it was funded entirely by state or city. 25% of it was funded entirely by uh, philanthropy, and about 5% was actually is unknown in citizen funding, right? Now, here's the really magical thing. We've been modeling this stuff and doing the, we've captured, scraped all the data with a timeline, so hopefully in a few weeks you'll see a little animation coming out with a whole animated model. And what you see is this. If you had shared just 10% of the land uplift in the first year, you would have paid for the High Line. Just 10%. Not 50%, not 60%, just 10%. Now, what this very accurately and as an extreme illustrates is that civic goods create private value. An outstanding school in the UK puts 70 to 100,000 pounds on a private housing adjacent to it. A public park does the same. Boston Parks is a great example of how they used to take 10% of the uplift value of land and bring it back into common goods. So what we understand is that common goods create private value. Common goods create private value. Historically, that value has just spilt over and been captured entirely by private sector. Now, the really interesting question is, what happens when you start to actually link those values up? So we're working on something called smart covenants, which actually, like historic covenants, where you would pay for, a, you would pay for the repair of a local church, uh, and that would be linked to your house. We're looking at how you could pay for common goods on the basis of the uplift value on your housing. And that means you can create... Communities can come in and say, right, we're willing to take, have this investment and share back the uplift of that investment back in. I think that's a pretty extraordinary situation which recognizes a mechanism of funding common goods in a way that we've never been able to do before, and we've been exploring some of that. Second thing you've already heard me speak about in terms of urban forests um, at the opening festival, talking about trees as infrastructure. How do we finance a whole ecosystem of trees? So in Paris, we've been working on an example of um, we're working with Climate Click on a case study example of basically saying if you didn't have a one and a half billion pound sewer and you, uh, for rainwater sewer, how would you actually put 638 micro urban forests to dampen um, uh, sustainable urban drainage, basically, to dampen the flow into the sewer system? That would only cost about 750 million uh, euros to buy the land and set the whole thing up. And then how do you account for the environmental services? Why that's important is if we want to finance civic goods, we have to understand these structural issues that sit behind them of how a tree is a liability on the books. Same thing applies to actually welfare goods. So the reason why we don't do preventative investment largely is because we don't account for provision. We don't make provision for future social costs on the balance sheets of states. Because without that provision, it's virtually impossible. So what social impact bonds are, many of you will heard them, is actually accounting innovation. That's all they are. Because they allow a state to look at the future costs and allow for capital investment against those costs. And that is an issue that states don't have. And I can keep going. And what we're seeing is a huge bunch of really interesting projects around the world that are looking at new ways of funding some of this infrastructure. And hopefully what I will do is, if the next slide comes up, um, we've been doing a case studies, and this will be released hopefully in the next couple of weeks or so, we did a case study, about 130 different case studies of civic goods financing. There's a brilliant one, if you get a chance, called Reef Capital. Reef Capital, what they did was they insured a beach, all the properties along a beach, took the premium of the insurance and restored the reef. Now, by restoring the reef, they reduced the risk of flooding on the properties. Now, why this is important is what they did was they crystallized future risk took that crystallization of future risk and managed that risk. You can do that with risk or opportunity. 
So how the mechanisms of dealing with it are really interesting, and I think are going to be critical for driving a lot of this stuff. And again, there are lots and lots of different examples of how we drive some of this stuff. And I think building financial literacy of how we finance civic goods is going to be really, really key in this story. Um, and system financing I can talk about. So this is a piece of work we're doing around the High Line, which is around the smart covenants, which breaks apart uh, property rights, Again, looks at smart covenants, but you can do a lot of this stuff together. There's a point I want to get to. Preventative economics. Again, this is again something we're doing as an example. If you want to do preventative intervention in the city, you have to change the public accounting infrastructure to make provision for future, future social costs. So here's the key. If you are diagnosed with hypertension, within eight weeks, the doctor can either give you time and exercises and support to effectively prevent you going on, uh, on um, um, blood pressure tablets or, or equivalent, or you can be on blood pressure tablets for the rest of your life. It is cheaper to actually support you in changing your life in the, those eight weeks. But it's very difficult still to actually make that provision, that cost analysis between future costs and present day intervention. The second part of the problem is GPs don't know how to allocate. Third, we don't know how to do social prescription in a technical evidence way. And that's where the data infrastructure, maybe some of you wearing smart watches are gonna be very, very powerful in this future, which is why Apple is investing a lot of time. Preventative health economics is pretty much going to be one of the biggest transformations in health dollar spend and health euro spend across the world and you have the data infrastructure to do it, I think it's gonna change the nature of our cities and our places, and I think it's gonna be critical for civic work in that future. My four big things, and I'm sure I've run out of time, is it is increasingly possible to look at system financing, which is how do you finance 20 different objects together. I'll share the slides, and there are some really interesting points around how do you finance 20 different things to work together, and you don't have to invest in all of them. Like I said, you can capture the spillover benefits of something by building a covenant. At the same time, you can give grant money on the other side. You can literally gift the grant money to the high line, you can give the money away to the high line on the basis of capturing the value on the third party. Right? So there are new mechanisms possible that are really key. Future orientation. How do we talk about future risk, crystallize that future risk? So the fire brigade was built after 1666, the Great Fire of London. Right? The Great Fire of London, the fire brigade service was built. Why? Because what happened was there was a bunch of insurance houses that came about who realized it was easier to go out and put out the fires than to pay the premiums of the street burning down. Right? And it was built, the fire brigade service was built by insurance companies, right? insurance houses. So future orientation is going to be critical. I think democratizing capacity of financing, how do we get citizens involved? So you, you know, you, why do we give 5 to 7% to Goldman Sachs? How do we open that up to actually citizens being part of that return is going to be key. And then the transparent governance. When you're doing complex financing or any form of this sort of social financing, you need radical transparency of those tools to be able to make sure there's actually authenticity of what you're doing and how you're doing it. And again, some of these trends are pulled together in a lot of the work that we're doing, and it opens up all sorts of examples in there. With that, thank you. So how about that? That was quite mind-blowing to me, at least. Um, thank you so much, Indy. I would love you to stay on stage. Indy, don't go away. <laughs> come back. Please have a seat. And I would also like to ask to come forward Hans Karseberg who is partner and founder of Stipo, public developer, please have a seat, and the initiator of the City Maker Fund, and also Juicy Tjerkia from the City of Milan. She's stakeholder engagement for the neighborhood development team at the City of Milan in Italy. So I know, uh, Indy, it's about uh, all of these different uh, projects all together and how we systematize them. But we are, we are going to boil down first a little bit to a couple of examples, but hopefully talk about how they interconnect uh, after that. So um, Hans, can I ask you first to explain a little bit more about what the CityMaker Fund is? Uh, yeah, of course. I want to start by saying that I do life like ice cream quite a lot. <laughs> So I hope we'll keep eating ice creams as well, but um, we need to start spending more money on the city makers. Um, and I'm very happy to be in this panel with you, Indy, because there's a straight line from the compendium for the civic economy that you guys wrote to the city maker fund that we've just uh, started. 
um, because we, in the discussions about it, we started noticing that a lot of the uh, initiative, initiatives that you've described, after some time, are running out of steam. Because there's no financial infrastructure to support them. Um, so, for instance, this is the Hof van Cartesius in Utrecht, and it's a wonderful initiative um, that um, is about the circular economy. It's a, a hub for the circular economy. And it's just been built uh, in the last uh, two years. And it's been such a massive success that they have enough tenants on the waiting list to grow three times as big and have a d bigger impact. And I think this is really a discussion about how to achieve a bigger impact with the civic initiatives. But they can't get a loan from a bank to do this. So they have a financial model, but they can't get a loan from a bank because a bank says two things. You need to bring your own money to the table, which they don't have. And the other thing is that um, they charge an interest rate, which doesn't enable them to have the social impact anymore. So this is what we started the City Maker Fund uh, for. Um, also because of the Packhaus, very much so, by the way, because we met with the Trier Stiftung in Germany who are doing this, and we were very much inspired by it. And with that story uh, that we picked up in a session we had with the Packhaus in Budapest, um, we then went to the province of Utrecht I said, you want to invest into the urban development, uh, the inner city urban development in your province, and you're talking with housing corporations, with municipalities, and with uh, corporate inv uh, investors and, and real estate developers. But there is this other category of people, of initiatives, who make sure that the cities uh, stay su sustainable, fun, attractive, uh, social, um, and you're not investing into those yet. Now, that was a, a well-received um, argument, and they decided to provide the first million uh, euros to start a, a city maker fund. And with that million euros, we could then go to a social bank, uh, the Triodos Bank, who said, who said, well, we will multiply that by five if you invest that money into land or property of uh, the, the city makers. So for us, this is a, a fund to help the civic initiatives buy their own land or uh, secure the, uh, the, the, the land uh, ownership uh, or the property ownership uh, and thereby sustain them. And, um, and we've worked out all kinds of models then if the, the value of the project increases, if the value of the property increases and after some time they've gathered enough money to buy it for themselves, how to share the value um, not in the way that you described for the Highland yet, so we're not looking at the neighboring uh, properties yet, which we should do probably at some point, mm -hmm. but at least for the, for the project itself. Thank you so much. And Juicy, to, on to you. Can you tell me a little bit of what you're doing in the city of Milan to uh, systematize oh, this? Yes. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, in Milan, I, I mean, I heard a lot about money today and actually also the previous days, and uh, I know money is important, but what happened when I, I moved back to Milan, I lived for a long time abroad, and um, I started seeing that actually having money or getting money was kind of easy, but then administrating that money was kind of complicated because then you need to go into administration and bureaucracy and you need to be transparent and you need a lot of time also just to organize the money flow that needs to come steady. Otherwise, you know, you start a project and then how do you support it in the long term? So what happened, I started just talking to different stakeholders, a little bit like the octopus that was mentioned before. And I realized that there were a lot of needs that were unaddressed and people didn't know how to basically put them together in a, in a system and then have an impact all together. What happened is like the, we have a neighborhood in Milan that is very similar to the your uh, cabot, like secluded and uh, very somehow um, challenging as a neighborhood. And uh, we noticed that people there were struggling sometimes with um, not really poverty, but were, sometimes they had, um, maybe they were in between jobs or they had like a family member that was sick 
or uh, they had an extra child that I didn't really plan on, and therefore the money was not enough. And, uh, and what happened also is I, I started talking to the food bank and um, they told me like, you know, we have so much food that we get from everywhere and we don't want to waste it, but uh, we can cover only one third of the population that actually needs it. So it's not that we're wasting it, we're giving it away, but still, you know, we would like to do more. At the same time, then I talked to the energy company in Milan, which is something like Nuon here, I guess, and they have a corporate volunteering policy. So all their employees, they have one day a year they can use for corporate volunteering and they can choose what to do. So that's very nice. They have 5,000 volunteer uh, employees, therefore 5,000 days that they can put out to the community, but they didn't really know how to uh, employ all those uh, days. And on the other hand, we had the local neighborhood organizations and we had also some volunteer, like citizens volunteers. And, um, and there was also the farmers association and they also said that like, you know, we are farmers, we, sometimes we overproduce. So we have some products that we could give away. So when I put all of these in the system, I asked nobody for money. I was like, we don't want money because that's gonna complicate things. And what we did, we just uh, met all together. And then the energy company came up with like uh, a very good solutions because they said, I can, you know, we can put like 10, 20 volunteers every month that can help with a project. We just need to find a project. We also have electric cars that we would like to actually promote electric transportations in, uh, in Milan. And therefore we can also offer mobility somehow. Uh, and that was on the table. Then the food bank was like, I can put food. The farmers were like, we can put fresh products. And, and then the neighborhood associations and the uh, citizens volunteers were like, okay, we can put together bags, like shopping bags. And uh, the neighborhood association was like, we can point out what are the families that are actually facing some difficulties. And we put all of these in a system and we created um, a Basically, we, we deliver um, shopping bags that are customized on the needs of families in this Kabut in, uh, in Milan every first Friday of every month. So they can count on around 25, 30 kilos of goods that are customized on their needs. So if there is a family with many kids, then they will get milk, they will get diapers, and they will get uh, baby food. But if there is, for example, a one-member family, like maybe an elderly, then is diabetic, then they will get you know, food that is customized for them. In this way, we also collaborated with the food policy in Milan because we would like to, to go to another zero waste, but of course to, to at least uh, raise awareness on food waste. And, uh, and doing this, then we, we hope that families will use everything they get. And um, at the same time, we also thought like, oh, but you know, when you are in a um, fragile condition, you often have um, not very good diet. So it's good that you maybe get to know what is a good diet, what you should eat and what, how and how much. Um, and in this neighborhood, there is a very, not a big, but a very local like um, hospital. And we involve them as well. We engage them and we ask them, like, would you like maybe to uh, give some information about how uh, it is to eat well? What, what are the consequences if you eat well or if you don't eat well? And what you should pay attention to if you are diabetic or if you are a kid or if you are an elderly? And the hospital came in and then we're like, sure, let, let's do it. So now it's summertime and we have a summer camp going on uh, beginning of July where the hospital will help the population to understand the needs and, uh, and the consequences of um, a good and a healthy diet. All of this was made without money and it's actually um, can go on forever, let's say, because as long as those resources are available, then that project can run. And actually now we're already thinking of scaling it up to other neighborhoods in Milan because everybody wants to do more and, uh, and there is more to do. So we were like, yeah, why not? And there is no money at all, <laughs> nothing. So there's no direct funding, but of course no. there's resources being put into this and, yes. and interest, yeah. Yes, but taking away the money really simplified yeah. and speed it up the process because yeah. we didn't have to go through the whole administration and the whole um, organizations of money flow. And yeah. especially we made it sustainable in the long term. And what I am seeing now, it's the more and more stakeholder want to come on board. Like they really like it. So I was surprised myself. There was not much theory. It was really just talking to different stakeholder and putting together uh, complementary needs. And what I think we made is just matching the contents with the containers. That's it. Thank you so much. So I think uh, both of India and Hans's uh, presentations also touched upon um, a little bit of the idea that 
it's not only about direct funding, but it's also about capacity building uh, in these in these new uh, schemes and new like the, to understand the financial system and to to use it to your own benefit. Indy, would you like to to um, reflect a bit on that? How it's about a larger thing than than the direct financial means. I, I mean, I, I think there are structural questions on the table, and I think my biggest thing is over the next 10 to 12 years, underneath it are big structural issues. And if we talk about, say, the examples I suppose I was trying to give about are super civics. Like, let's, they are large scale super civic in, in, in models. And the question for me is, those super civics require us to recognize that civic goods create private value. And so my typical example is, if I took a house here and I moved it to you know, Nova Scotia, middle of Nova Scotia, middle of, not Halifax, um, middle of Nova Scotia, it's worth next to nothing. It's probably not even worth its construction value. Uh, yet in Amsterdam, it's worth huge amounts of money. Now, where does that value come from? Well, its value doesn't come from the material goods of the house. It doesn't even come from, uh, it comes from, here's the key words, the monopolistic access that the, that house provides two common goods, labor markets, transportation, uh, schools, all those things. So when your house goes up in value, what goes up in value? Not the house, the common goods. We've had a misinterpretation of how value in cities has been created and a missed allocation of that value. And that's why for me, there's a sort of, and in a way it follows exactly on as you were saying, Hank, that that was the pieces of work that we were seeing from the civic economy, that the business models and the models of civic economy were trying to still do object business models, yet their value was being actually misunderstood. So we have to re-understand how values of civic goods are created and thereby build a whole new class of civic business models or value models, whichever we want to call them, I don't really mind. But there is a new way of creating civic goods, and I think that's going to be fundamental for moving us forward. In fact, I was to be bold enough, I would say the biggest business models of the 21st century will all be uh, around civic goods. And I think that's my kind of bold claim, because technology has reduced the cost of bureaucracy to near zero to allow us to create whole new models of financing at a system scale that we've never been able to do. So I think there's a shift, a paradigm shift from going from the private economy to the civic economy at a macro level. And I think that's where we are. We don't know how to govern it yet. Amazing. Hans? Um, yes. Um, so I think Juicy's story shows how diverse the, the landscape of civic initiatives is really. Um, we are talking about a category of civic initiatives who, who, do, uh, who have a presence in an area, who want to reinvent that area, open up buildings for people who would otherwise not have a place in the, in the city anymore. And for that you do need, need money. Um, and if I, you, I can use myself and, and the whole from Cartesian as, a, as an example actually. We are always involved in projects very much out of passion for the city, passion for this idea that we share here, we don't necessarily know about money. So for us it has been tremendously important to start collaborating with uh, Stadtquadrat, um, a, a team of uh, financial planners who uh, added uh, to us. And then we could go to the private market and to municipalities and well, that's Theo Stoutener. Theo would basically say the same thing that I was saying, I thought, but then if I was explaining it, everybody's saying, yeah, yeah, that's nice. And then what Theo would say, it is, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so we all need a Theo. And actually, in this case of the Hof van Cartesius, um, it was uh, started by uh, Charlotte Ernst, who was an architect, uh, no idea about the financial side of things. And we did a first workshop with them, and, and, and then we said, you, you need your, to organize your own Theo. And in her case, her sister had just lost her job working for a bank. So her sister decided to join the initiative, and that's where it really became real. It, it turned from an idea into this, what you're seeing now. Um, so that's capacity building. Um, and then we did all sorts of workshops to help them improve their financial model because they had made a lot of uh, assumptions that didn't fit the, 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 the spreadsheets and we could improve the case and, and now we're helping them to finance to grow to three times as large as they are now. So, so I, I think capacity building is a, is a, is a big issue. Yeah, absolutely. 
Thank you. So how about for the last, the last notion of this panel? Uh, to, to touch upon uh, the notion that, that Indy made before, how civic goods create private value, and how can we get those, those funding streams to become part of this civic economy? Juicy, maybe? Uh, you want me to answer the one without oh. the money? Well, no, but no, but maybe you have ideas on that right now. You said to me, you were just getting started in Milan, so who knows about the future? Yeah, no, true. I mean, um, I, I, I agree with, I mean, the, of course, the, there is a need for money. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not that naive thinking like, okay, we can go on without. I'm just trying to give an example of how capacity building and impact can be made also by, by and for citizens, uh, just because they have the will and they have the, the, the resources to do that. Um, when we talk about financing, I know in, in Italy, for example, and I cannot really um, be clear about that, at, there are funds, and there, there are also European funds, and there, there are loads of, uh, loads of possibilities. What I find a problem sometimes is to the capacity of those citizens to apply and to go through the funding process. Like sometimes those funds are very difficult to understand, and sometimes the, the quality of the applications doesn't equal to the quality of the project, and those people are not able to fill that gap. And that's, for, as far as my experience goes, the, the biggest issue to address because the money and the resources are there and sometimes it's difficult to get access to that from the bottom up. Yeah. So I, I think the, we try to play a very active role. Um, so that's why we started at the le level of the province of Utrecht and to develop all the networks and to really sit down and work with the people, right? So, so that you kind of become this intendant, intendant I like, really like that word from Antwerp, or an intermediate uh, between these different worlds, uh, because you need negotiators between them. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, we would love for uh, every city in Europe to have a city maker fund, um, to have uh, a range of local uh, funds, because that's how we set up a, a financial investment structure, infrastructure for uh, making the civic initiatives grow, uh, making them having a more a deeper impact. Um, and uh, we, we would love to ask for your help, actually, how we, how we can do that. So, uh, because we are not linked to all those European funds at all, we just started a, a city maker fund in the province of Utrecht, and we would love that now to uh, ask for your help to duplicate that and uh, get this uh, happening in all over Europe. Yeah, so uh, actually to, to, to increase <laughs> increase that small bubble that Indy just showed to uh, to make it bigger in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. Indy, you would like to share some comments? Uh, I was just going to uh, share an example uh, that's happening in uh, Trento uh, in Italy um, with some friends of ours. Um, and we, we came up, so what Trento City Council are doing are procuring a hospital. It's a quarter of a billion euros of hospital. Now what they did, and this is kind of in, in interesting, is when they procured it, they procured, they didn't procure spaces or services. What they procured was effectively, this is the demand that we have to meet. And what that meant was the provider is now only spending 200 million on the building, but 50 million on prevention, which is extraordinary how a city can change the procurement rules and what it's buying to allow for different models of innovation on the supply side, on the other side. And that was extraordinary. So 50 million on prevention by a private sector, the provider. Now imagine what you could do with 50 million and prevention in places like that. And that's, good, that's an extraordinary idea that if you start to manage demand in new ways, and that's the role of public procurement, I think has a massive journey to play in this. And the other thing I would say, there's some really good examples, and I think public procurement innovation is going to be one of the most interesting things. So I would encourage, if you're part of public procurement, to actually run public procurement open accelerators. 12-week processes around challenges that you have, which are done openly in a civic process to design those solutions with, uh, in an open way. And there's some really good examples of doing that, which changes the nature of outcomes and also changes the authenticity and the transparency of those outcomes in completely different ways. So I would just say, in terms of civic goods, that's a really important way of looking at procurement. I think procurement is a very powerful device and is going to be critical into the future. 
Thank you. So it's more about it, the, the money is actually there, the, the private funds are there, the public funds are there. It's more a matter of allocation in a preventative way, basically. I'm gonna, oh, do you want us to reflect? No, no, I just wanted to, to comment on him yeah, and I, sure. uh, quickly. And I just thought that, that the money is there, that the, the companies are there, and I think it's a matter of also connecting different sectors and stop thinking in terms of we are the government, we are the associations, we are the business, we are, we are all part of society. In a much more so integrated it's a more manner. ecosystem, yeah. ecosystem way of approach. Yeah. I think that's also what we're here for at the We Make the City Festival, the ecosystem approach. So right before we move into the coffee break, I have time for one or two questions for uh, this last, very last uh, panel. Who would like to? Hello, yes, I'm Susan Stooping from Origami. I'd like to ask India a question about climate change. So you started with climate change and I'd be very interested in hearing a little bit more about your application with finance and climate change. Marshall Plan, fabulous, okay. So, uh, great question. Um, so, for example, the example I gave about reef capital was all to do with how you do restoration. There's some really brilliant work going on, for example, in New York, which was done originally, which looked at insurance companies looking at how they could do flood risk management by actually building underground car parks in Holbroken, which would effectively absorb the flood water so it didn't hit New York. That was entirely paid for by insurance companies managing their risk. So what we're seeing is the crystallization of risk is going to be a key device in financing some of this transition. So insurance companies are gonna, I think, be some of the key actors in managing that, and I think we have to start to think about that in for civic infrastructure projects in really big ways. So that's just the hints that we're seeing. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on around that. Then you can do also do, there's some really brilliant work being talked about resilience neighborhoods, where you can get 50 different neighborhoods, uh, 50 to 60 different you know, partners in a neighborhood to come together to do resilience work and invest in their shared resilience, again, around collective insurance. So what you do is you firstly help them take collective insurance out, which crystallizes the risk, then you use that insurance premium to do the resilience work in the neighborhood, and that manages the risk down. So we are starting to see these new collective spatial mechanisms for financing those sort of transitions. Those are examples, um, and that's the sort of examples that we're exploring. There's also another one, which is around peat. So we know peat across across Northern Europe is a very powerful CO2 producer and is declining, so the peak grounds are actually being degraded. How do you finance the maintenance of them is one of the big things on the off of Northern Europe. And peat releases more CO2 than anything else that you can imagine. So we have to build new financial models which are around the maintenance of those peat grounds on the basis of the CO2 they would release if you didn't maintain them. And that's again an assurance risk model around, uh, around some of these places. So these are the typologies of models that are going to be really important and I think we have to design them. That's the other thing. These are design problems, not financial instruments problems. They're about how value is created in 21st century. So that's why we need more strategic designers to be thinking about how we do this work. Uh, the financial stuff, they're brilliant financial people waiting to actually be part of this conversation. Thank you. So the very last question before we move into the coffee break. Thanks. Um, you are talking about spillover um, value, and especially in housing. And I was wondering, because in um, Amsterdam, there are a lot of neighborhoods that are mostly rented housing, yeah. and I live, um, I've live. i been living in a house for five years, and the prices are going up and up and up. And why is that? Because the neighborhood is getting better and better and better. We're talking about gentrification and everything. So aren't you excluding a very large group of people when you're talking about value, upvaluing a house? Because I know a lot of people, I'm a student myself, that have rented housing, especially in neighborhoods like the Cape Verde, that a lot of houses are not bought. So how do you explain this? Isn't, yeah. isn't this a social economic? It is, and this is in New York where you're running two double, what we've been modeling out is two different strategies. If you use your house, you actually pay at the point that you sell, and if you rent it, rent it, whether it's a house or a commercial product, actually you pay an annual fee back to the common goods. So you're finding a mechanism to price in that social good valuation onto the uplift. Now, I think there is a bigger question about and this is, I think you're absolutely right to bring it up. One of the biggest questions we have, and I think this is a, a sort of a, I'll, maybe I'll leave this for our drinks and our coffee, but the biggest problem that we have right now is that lots of capital is allocated to rent-seeking infrastructures. Actually, the risk that capital is taking is very low in the market. So what we've got is rent-seeking infrastructures, our land, our 
healthcare, education, you're seeing lots of money go in. So if you look at the, the where money allocation is in the US, which is a good indicator, all those goods which are civic or actually civic or rent-seeking infrastructures is where money is being allocated or digital infrastructures, whereas actually risk infrastructures are very little allocation. So there is a fundamental thing about the nature of the cities and environments we're building, which are all about rent-seeking. And I think one of the biggest problems that we have in our cities is that we've, we're, we're driving rent-seeking from value. And that's largely to do with a conversation I was having right on the, on the opening night, which is as we grow intangible assets, intangible assets are all all being rent sought on land. And that's why land has gone up five times in value over the last 30 years, more than any other land asset class. So there's a big question about land economy. That was my last slide, about how we really reinvent our land economy. And that is going to be fundamental to understanding how value is created and shared among citizens. The other thing we are looking at is as a citizen dividend as a part of the uplift. So we're looking at three components, because it's not just land that creates value, but citizens. So there's three components to that story. And what does a citizen dividend look like in a city? What would happen if all the future development rights of Amsterdam, which they do, belong to citizens? Which they do, right? In planning, that's exactly. The future development rights are collectively owned. What would happen if that was actually an actual dividend mechanism to share that value to citizens? Could you fund a UBI off the back of that? Could you fund a partial UBI off the universal basic income off the back of that? I think we're going to have to play these big, large strategic questions out in that sort of format. And I think it's a really important question. Thank you. Some final remarks, Hans? Yeah, I just wanted to add to this. Um, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that there is going to be gentrification. Um, but we need to reinvent systems of how to share the, 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 the profits made in the gentrification process between building owners, investors, and the, 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 the people using the, the, the buildings and the community. So in the case of the stock markets funds, we can, we can totally see that a project like this will have an increased uh, uh, value in the, in the future. Um, so we decided uh, to use a system here the, in Dutch, it would be called Erfpacht, right? Land lease. But we're not going to use Erfpacht, we're going to use Verpacht. Um, so we say, if in 10 years you would like to buy the building and you have enough money for that and land, and the value has increased, then we will uh, have a certain percentage coming back to the city maker fund because we are the ones investing into it and that will enable new investments into future city makers. But uh, 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 a part of that uh, value increase will go to you as the initiative as well. So I think we need to re reinvent those systems of sharing uh, the effects of gentrification. Okay, with no further ado, it's time for the coffee break. Thank you so much for your focus for this first two hours, oh, an hour and a half, I would say. Make sure to be back here at 11.30, so go get your coffee in the, in the hallway, and we're going to continue with the creative bu bureaucrats at 11.30.
So welcome back. Please come and get seated again after your coffee break. After the good focus you had for the first uh, hour and a half, you got recharged with a little bit of coffee, so I think we can handle the next uh, quite complex topic of the creative bureaucracy that we will be talking about for the, for the next hour. So um, we touched upon in, the, in the, first, uh, the first two panels, we touched upon the, the more like power switches that we need to make or the, the shifts in the financial systems that we need to make. But one of the key points about these shifts are also the sort of the shifts in the bureaucracy that are necessary in order to increase the impact of these civic um, initiatives or these new civic movements. So we're going to speak about that with a, a highly... Um, appreciated panel. We're going to start with the presentation of Charles Landry, the International Authority of Creative Bureaucracy Movement. And then we'll move into that uh, by presentation of the, the Societal Pact of Amsterdam. And then we'll speak with uh, a few super creative bureaucrats from the cities of Amsterdam, Helsinki and Milan. But first I want to ask to come to the stage, Charles Landry. Ooh, yes. Ooh. It's great to be here. It's so sort of cosy. Um, now, what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about the future. But, in fact, we've seen variations of the future already. You remember that William Gibson phrase, the future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. And some of the case studies were effectively that. But I think they're obviously the darker side to the future. And we all know that we're in the midst of a sort of systemic crisis and a business as usual approach will not get us to where we want to be. And I happen to be chairing the EU, some commission thing on the future of cities, and that is the first sentence. So it's not a bit of, a bit of this and a bit of that. It has to be obviously integrated and so on. So that question of waking up, which I think all the speakers, which were fantastic beforehand, and thank you very much for all those great examples, they all gave us variations of needing to wake up from decarbonizing the economy to many other things we all know about. Now, the creative bureaucracy is a strange word because you might say, what the fuck does that mean? No, you might say, what does that mean? Um, now, what it partly means is saying not everybody in a public administration is stupid. There are many interesting people there, but often they're trapped by structures, systems and all of that. So it's basically taking an encouraging approach because bureaucracy or a public administration, of course we need. We need the public good and all of that. But we know that the image is all about frustration and so on. But there are three aims of this idea. The first is really saying and revealing that the public interest is a vocation. The common good, trying to say the common good is a great vocation to have. Secondly, to shift, therefore, the way a bureaucracy is seen, not, only, not necessarily only as negative, and thirdly, to try and attract young people to want to be involved in these public good processes. And the three sort of pillars, if you want to put it like that, are on the one hand, rethinking the incentives and regulations for the 21st century. Secondly, to re-also assess the inner life of these systems, because there's this hidden talent that can't burst out that I think we need to give the opportunity to. Not I, I hope many people. And thirdly, to find new ways of establishing trust between the different partners and people who are involved in this collective endeavour called city making. And the aims, obviously, or the goals, obviously, are the big goals we all know. Addressing the problems that really matter, we've already heard about those today. Secondly, turning these things into reality. To actually decarbonise the economy means doing some radical rethinking at every level in order to do, to do things. And thirdly, obviously, it's creating fairer, more livable cities, all the things that you all discuss all the time. And everywhere we are, people and cities are thinking, where do we go and how do we get there? And I think we all know that the issues we're talking about are complex. I like the example of, of, of the High Line. I had a conversation with Robert Hammond, who's one of the founders of the High Line, and he said, the one thing I didn't do in advance was to think about value capture. If only I had those several billions that were raised, if I'd found a mechanism, I wouldn't have to struggle every year and so on. 
But we all know what a wicked problem is. A wicked problem is something you have to address. You don't, it's not a linear solution. And one of the interesting, I've just put this up because I like this slide I took in Zurich, which says Renaissance. And the one artist that didn't let the house be torn down said resistance in the same writing. But really what that artist was saying, let's have a conversation or perhaps not, I don't know. But anyway, all I'm saying, they're intractable problems, which, which we saw earlier from obesity to whatever else. Um, now, in a sense, obviously what we're into, and it says in the midst of redesigning, it's more in the midst of needing to redesign the ethical system, the political system, economic system, and so on. And it obviously needs some sort of idea of where the hell we're going. So, as I said earlier, it's less business as usual approach, just digging the hole. It's really understanding the risk nexus that we're involved in. And the risk nexus is this interconnected, inextricably interwoven set of issues that impact upon each other, that therefore become complex as distinct from complicated. The difference between complicated is, complicated is relatively logical, going to the moon, very difficult, but complicated, bringing up a child, complex because it's relational. We can't predict how the next step goes. Then of course, overriding all of this is the vast breakthrough that is the digitizing world and its immersive effect that we all know about. But then that effect that allows so many people to be in so many places, which is why I wrote this thing called the civic city in a nomadic world. What do we do? How do we meet? How do we connect? in places that we feel all right about each other. Not necessarily that we love each other, it says places of empathy, but at least in some sense are moving ideally in the same direction. And so the idea of all of this creative bureaucracy stuff is essentially saying, how can we think afresh and unleash the talent that we know is in there? in these institutions. And of course the critique, we all know what it's about. It's about, oh, I don't know, everything is complicated, too many reports written. This is the Paris reports on environment. You know, it's just quite a nice list. Lovely picture, isn't it? <laughs> um, but you know what I'm getting at. And then the fact that so much is operated in boxes, in small departments, rather than looking at things in an integrated way. Now the thing is, um, that, as we well know, there are many good people for many reasons who enter these institutions, which are vast, from education to whatever, and something happens along the way. And it's trying to get rid of that along the way. They've made choices to work in the public domain. They want to be involved in the public good, but there's something happens. And so as the good ideas go through the system, so often they evaporate in one way or another. And so the overall challenge, or this is of course very simple because I'm just doing a little thing here, a 10 minute thing, is how do you move from a no because culture to a yes if culture? We all know that sentence is incredibly easy to say and difficult to do. But if one does that shift, that culture of the organization becomes in the way it thinks, acts, uh, plans and acts, a different form of organization. And what that then does is completely reassesses the rules and regulations and incentives for what we want, rather than saying, this is what we have as regulations, fit your vision or your daringness and courage into that which we already have. And so what it's really doing is a complete reframing. And the, the book I wrote with my colleague, Margie Course, is called The Creative Bureaucracy and Its Radical Common Sense. And it's trying to see this all as absolutely commonsensical that we need to go in that way. And one of the things that is so frustrating, having interviewed and spoken to hundreds and hundreds of public servants, is there's a misalignment between their private life. In their private life, they do all sorts of things. They're interesting people. And in their public life, so work life, they are so often reduced. And so I say sometimes, and I'm saying it here, not necessarily always true, sometimes these institutions recruit the brightest and train them to conform. So therefore, 
as I end my little speech, speech, whatever this is, I'd just like to say, of course there's inspirations. And I think all of our workshops later, and we had some of these inspirations this morning, will cover those uh, inspirations. If you know German, this just means multi-talent, you know, even garbage people have talent. But it's actually at every level of the organization, but we'll explore other examples later. But one of the things that's so interesting, which is why I like the Torino uh, Biennale Democrazia, is that one of the things we haven't reinvented, we've reinvented business models and many things, is really the democracy itself and those processes. And of course, there are examples that you all know about. Um, so what we're really doing, we, I don't know who the we is, but all of us hopefully, is we need to, in a world of change, move away from the letter of rules and laws to the spirit. What is the intent we're trying to achieve and where are we trying to go? And I think if we do that, as it says in this graffiti in Krakow, that you may or may not be free again. And therefore, the way we plan or think of planning, and planning, of course, has changed. Planning is more about mediation than, you know, physical stuff only is really moving away from the classic model of predict and provide, I will provide a kilometre of road, to elastic planning, which is really being strategically principled and incredibly courageous about a few things, but tactically flexible, because we don't know how one will get from A to B. But the principles keep us anchored in where we might need to be. So that all in a digital world. So finally, there is a thing called the creative bureaucracy. And there was a great photo taken by Ramon here. He's Finnish, Spanish or something like that. But it had a wonderful vibrancy. 1,300 people came looking at different ways of being in a bureaucracy. The mayor opened it, all of that sort of stuff. Various people, you know, were giving their examples. But perhaps most importantly, it was the informality, the fuck-up night, which was great. The biggest fuck-up in Germany, as you well know, is the Brandenburg Airport, 10 billion minus, eight years down. And this is the project manager explaining how the complexity and the fuck-up occurred, which was riveting, as you can imagine. So, and then finally, of course, there are heroes and heroines. I don't need to mention who these are, but we just feel that so often the hidden hero heroine needs to be acknowledged too. So there we are. Uh, there are more of these events happening elsewhere. The Berlin thing is just coming up. Uh, we've just come last week from something in Valencia. Um, anyway, these are the places where things are happening. Reinventing the municipality in Brussels something in Vienna about social stuff, etc., etc., And uh, that's broadly where we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. So may I ask to come forward Jasper Etten? So uh, ever since we had uh, municipal elections uh, last year here, uh, you've been working in different uh, tables across the city to come up with a new societal pact, and you're here to present us some of the points there. Jasper Etta. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Charles, uh, also for this uh, great uh, little lecture of things that I think we all recognize here in Amsterdam that is uh, difficult, complex, but very interesting and hopefully a way to go. Uh, we will talk about that later on today. But uh, good morning to you all and thank you for uh, this invitation here. Um, it's an honor for, for us uh, um, to, to be a part of this great festival and to be a part of uh, this group of great people here. Um, Mark 020, make 020. Uh, is an initiative uh, of a team of city makers uh, and the project started uh, about uh, a year ago. It is based on, a, on the work of city makers, uh, many city makers in the last uh, 13 or more years in Amsterdam. The main goal is to write a social contract or you, know, you can give it another name, this is how we translate it for now, for Amsterdam to enable Amsterdamers to create an inclusive, healthy, fair and initiative-rich city, including a hands-on, 
how-to manual. We started the project in November, and now over 600 Amsterdamers have given input and are connected. And the last five weeks, indeed, over 40 talks and tables uh, around the city, throughout the city, um, there were more than 300 people uh, involved. And the people were excited. They were curious, involved, willing, and prepared. And an incredible amount of work and ideas, all about ownership and equal say. It was so much, so much that we have made an, an Excel sheet to put everything in there and it was too big to present it all over here in one picture. It's incredible. And one said to me, after so many years of struggling with my initiative in the town, now this really gives me hope. And from all that work and input as the next step for now, we assembled a list, uh, a hundred issues list with principles, conditions, and over 60 potential agreements. And uh, we show you a few now. Uh, these are the Dutch ones. There is a picture with English ones. I will uh, read them for you now, a few. The Right to Challenge make a success of two Right to Challenge initiatives, the Red Solving Plan in New West and uh, the Roadside Maintenance in Rural Amsterdam North. Establishing uh, energy corporates in neighborhoods. Start one clear common in the Xarpeter neighborhood. 2% of the annual city budget for the new Amsterdam co-creation approach. Uh, property prevention by and for social entrepreneurs. A coalition of healthcare experts by experience with a meaningful say in health policy issues. And socializing real estate. Now we can see and feel the wish, the need and the urge by so many involved, people from the town hall, but also universities and schools, and entrepreneurs, big and small, social institutes, banks, housing corporations, we call it the pentahelix, or the, the, we even called it the sexy helix, but uh, 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 many of them were at our tables. And we also hear youngsters who, yes, Charles, who, who want to have a more direct and daily form of connection with ownership and democracy. But we also hear this large sign of distrust and we see the loss of knowledge, experience and value. So now it's time to change, to do better. We hear, we hear the strong wish for a change, for connection, for local organization of ownership and equal say, to be exposed and valuable with their initiatives and value for the town, for the people. The wish that all their work and our work has a chance to stay, to sustain, longer than for a few years. And then, of course, there is this issue of the bigger and complex process of change that we can and want to design. So it's also our goal to connect all that energy in town to show each other the strong, big and rich town as it is. And that connection and strength is such a big value for our town. So if we want to make that change, if we really want to start working in the co-creative Amsterdam approach, as we, as we call it, if we want this new way of working together to be embedded in our systems, we need each other. That is simply, but obviously, not that simple to achieve. All these fifth five or six parties in the pentahelix, we, we have to co-create that connection to help share this value of all of us, to make us that inclusive town that we want to be. Amsterdam has a long tradition of democracy, with changes by protest and revolts. These days, the revolt is more diffuse, but mis unmistakable, it's there. Our world is changing worldwide, and deep in the neighborhoods of Amsterdam. And now it's time that our democratic system follows that change. We are happy and grateful that the politician Rutger Grootwassink stepped up into the area wanting to help actively to change the democratic bureaucratic system. That he is creating an, an agenda on democracy that gives us space to make this next step. Rutger, you know, this is a next step, but uh, we still have a long way to go. 
And the next step for us will be that we will write this summer uh, uh, the social contract in real text. For now, uh, this is the start. But if we have that contract written in the fall, that is actually the real start. But for now, we would like to present to you this 100 issue list in a very special way. Thank you, well, thank you, Jasper. Um, I will... Uh, <laughs> um, Rutger, Great Washing, our elderman. I'd like to present to you our uh, blossoming tree that is almost toppling over because of the weight of all the fruit that's growing by the day. But we need to look after it together, as you can see. And... Uh, I would like to ask you to come forward because we, we promised to uh, work on everything this tree and the fruit stands for every day as long as you every now and then water it. So I, will hold that. I filled it with champagne, so if you would please. <laughs> water. All oh, right, there we go. Yes. Ah, that's what me. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much. And indeed, it needs some watering. Uh, I really, really, really hate gardening. So, if I only have to provide it with some water, uh, that would be that would be great. It's something green. It's something green. Yeah. Um, no, but thank you very much. I think that uh, uh, in reaction, I only can say that as city board, we're blessed with so many people involved in the city and city making and so many people working on this. So I'm very happy and we'll have a lot of discussions. Uh, we'll have a lot of talks about this because this is only one next step, but we need several more. Um, uh, but thank you very much for, these, uh, for this tree and uh, I'll make sure that uh, it will get some water. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you Jasper, thank you Karin van Assen Delft and Rutger, please stay with me because you'll be up next. Um, so he wasn't really uh, presented before, but this is our, uh, our creative bureaucrat and deputy mayor for social affairs, diversity and democracy, who was here with us last year, knew that he was by then, I think, five days in the office. So uh, glad to have you here after a year of experience and please have a seat you. and you'll be joined by some colleagues. So may I ask to step forward as well? Um, Annie Sinemaki, who just came in from Helsinki this morning. And she is the Deputy Mayor for Urban Environment in Helsinki. So please have a seat. And please come forward, Lorenzo Liparini from Milan, Deputy Mayor for Participation, Active Citizenship and Open Data. So very welcome, and uh, Ritger already had the chance to, uh, to re respond a bit to what was offered to him. So I would love to, uh, to ask maybe uh, Ani Sinimaki first. I have to say, I would never call myself a bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never. so maybe, maybe that's a good opening question then. So how much of a bureaucrat are you, or aren't you? Well, uh, uh, probably I'm infected by it, but uh, I don't think that I should see, my, uh, I don't see myself as a bureaucrat. I try... Um, in, in a sense, um, to break the bureaucracy or to work around it, and maybe that's creative bureaucracy, but um, I'm not that sure that I So you're not that person that feels like in that box, stuck? No. No? No. no okay. No. Okay, let's hear from your colleagues. How is that with you guys? <laughs> Well, I come from activism. Uh, just three years ago, I was uh, campaigning for reopening uh, uh, of the ancient canals in Milan. Uh, you know, Milan and Amsterdam are linked uh, because we have some thousand of kilometers of canals uh, under our streets, and we would, would like to reopen it all. So we campaigned hard to have. Uh, we had some half million of uh, Milanese people uh, uh, voting for a referendum asking for that. So uh, then I, I found myself uh, inside the administration taking care of the same people uh, that uh, I tried to organize against the municipality to, to have this great, great uh, big uh, project. Uh, so no, I, I am a, an activist bureaucrat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I would go with that. What about you, Ani Sinemaki? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, uh, nice to see you, everyone. <laughs> great to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, 
I had uh, this year's March, I organized a uh, breakfast um, with music and speeches uh, and even some mimosas uh, to celebrate actually uh, the 20 years that had passed uh, since I was for the first time elected to the Finnish national parliament. Uh, so at least I'm sort of... Uh, an old timer <laughs> in, in that sense, but I, um, I think um, um, I see my role quite often being an elected uh, politician, but also in the leadership of the city, uh, that I'm like um, the interpreter of uh, between two different worlds, decision makers and civil servants and citizens. Uh, I never see myself in a box because I think that this position actually gives you a really uh, wide uh, landscape of uh, seeing things. And, um, and I think that I quite often try to explain the uh, feelings and necessities that the uh, public feels or the pressures uh, that they put to the bureaucracy and then perhaps the civil service, I tried to encourage them to, uh, to rethink, uh, to, to go into the dialogue and also to encourage them to uh, actually show their full expertise to public. Because I think um, quite often uh, there is no sort of substantial dialogue that would um, show everything everyone has in its full potential. Good. I see Rutger nodding quite a bit. You see yourself as somewhat of a, a mediator as well between these, these worlds? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, as, as, as politicians, as, as elected um, um, uh, people, that, that you have the, 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 the role, your function is to, 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 to be a liaison officer and to stand between groups of people and uh, the interests and the the, the, the bureaucracy or the, the institution uh, yourself, but I also think that in a way you should, at least I try to see myself as, um, as, a, as a front runner or, some, or, or you try to push changes that people from outside will see. Um, what you were saying, that, you're, yeah, that, that uh, civil servants uh, should, should try to reinvent themselves. Uh, I think that is a role of, of, a, of somebody who is elected, but also in, in re, um, I was going to say reframing, but that's not the right word. I think that in, in, in re-establishing what is the public value that, that we, we need, and of course my public value is also an ideological uh, value because of, hey, I'm a politician. But to, to, um, in the city board you, you have to uh, think and investigate and see what is the public value that the city needs. Um, 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 next to all the international developments that we talked about, decarbonization, uh, um, making a new economic model and stuff like that. So, but then how do you, um, and this is for all of you, how do you sort of instrumentalize these, this yes-if culture within within the rest of the system? Because you have these positions as maybe front runners and you can give the ideological example, but then there's also that system of people that may feel boxed a bit every now and then by the system that's designed around them. Yeah. Is there, are there ways of, of to, to instrumentalize this, this yes-if culture that Charles was referring to? Uh, I think um, one of the examples that uh, Charles Laundry gave was uh, having new people uh, in the bureaucratic system. And I think that is one way of working, uh, bringing in people who have an outside view, but also who at the same time uh, deeply value and want to work uh, within the city. And I think in Helsinki we have quite a good experience from that, uh, that we have uh, managed to uh, have lately uh, many new faces that uh, for sure wanted to come and serve the city and the citizens and their reason and motivation to come to work for the city uh, as civil servants uh, really uh, was that they wanted to uh, work for the common good uh, 
in comparison, perhaps, their background, not everyone came from the uh, private sector, but some, some really uh, came. And I thought um, uh, this morning's uh, main newspaper uh, in, in Helsinki had an interview of, uh, of the person who was just elected to be the cultural director of the city, uh, and the city board uh, confirmed that appointment uh, on Monday. And the subtitle said that uh, uh, this person, uh, Mari Mannister, was appointed uh, regardless uh, of her lacking a civil service background or civil servant background. And I think with this um, kind of work that um, when you take people who, um, who have a fresh eye on the talents and on what actually uh, the city civil service can do, uh, but have not stayed there for long and are not attached to every uh, detail of the process, that is one way, one good way of renewing uh, the the city service and uh, changing things. Uh, perhaps not in a soft way, but uh, anyway, it's probably not the harshest way mm. <laughs> either. But I, I think a good way. Do you relate to that, Lorenzo, as a yeah. fresh well, breeze having, in the new city council of Milan? Having new people uh, in terms uh, uh, of pu public functioner inside the administration would be a great issue, but uh, it is not so simple in Italy uh, to hire people inside the administration. So <laughs> we try to have directly uh, citizen, active citizens uh, uh, cooperating and collaborating in uh, the administration, and that's why we established uh, uh, my office, which is a new office, uh, which uh, uh, speak to, to all the people uh, active uh, on the ground, but also inside to public functioners uh, that uh, we try to involve culturally in uh, a new kind uh, of work, uh, which is uh, dealing with their job, everyday job, but together with uh, the people uh, on the ground. And we established a new regulation on shared administration of common goods, which is a kind of uh, Bologna regulation. Uh, regulation but is uh, newer of course and is based on co collaboration pacts uh, and uh, we are starting uh, working uh, not only with the traditional uh, representative bodies such as association uh, on the ground but also with uh, informal groups and uh, in Milan it's very common now to have social streets uh, like uh, uh, people on the ground uh, these are groups of people um, <laughs> starting meeting on social networks uh, such as Facebook, uh, Facebook groups, but they represent uh, some thousands of people inside these groups and they start uh, asking us uh, to manage with services uh, with uh, concrete requests from their territory. And so we start uh, uh, to have a register of these realities. We have a kind of 80 uh, in Milan and 40 of them are starting meeting with us uh, regularly and uh, to work uh, with the administration to define services and pacts uh, to uh, have to to deal with the uh, renovation of the city and uh, uh, activity like uh, uh, maintenance of public space and uh, rethinking of space. I think that, that uh, there are a couple of things that you can do. For example, um, um, in a way, it's just about opening up your institutions. I mean, we work with like Mac uh, and other city uh, city makers. Uh, so, in in a way, it's also something that you shouldn't talk about too much, but should be done. Uh, and of course, it helps when you have uh, a budget and a dedicated team that uh, tries to identify. Uh, the uh, the let, bureaucrats is, is, has a very negative uh, sound to it, but I know that there are a lot of uh, uh, civil servants who see that that they should work on a, on a different way, and in in the sense we try to organize those civil servants in in uh, let's start our own rebel movement within the institutions uh, to help to 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 change that, and I think that works. Uh, but also it helps if you uh, have um, um, budgets and projects uh, to see how to, uh, how to change. And I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm very inspired by the talk that, that, that you gave. Um, and I'm quite sure that I really would like to organize not one, but several fuck-up nights. Because we had an amazing amount of fuck-ups in Amsterdam. I mean, if you look at our metro system, it, it, I mean, it's, 
it's great. It's it's like the, the, the best metro system in the world, but it has been a, a huge fuck up. And I think that um, this is also something of a mental change within institutions. Because when I started uh, in office, um, uh, I asked, show me some of the uh, uh, participation projects. And all the projects were, this is great, this is great. And I said, I'm not interested in pro participation projects that are great. Show me where it failed, show me where it didn't work, and we should learn from that. So, um, and so acknowledge that, that failure um, is, is something that, that, that helps you, uh, should be way more, um, more, well, way more into our institutions. Thank you so much, because that is actually the next question that I had for you. What is the role of, of vulnerability in these processes? Because I think uh, Charles clearly showed that in order to be a creative bureaucrat, you also need to you know, make space almost for your vulnerability and your human side and the fact that you may make mistakes, but that you're learning from it and that you're learning together with other people. Uh, would you like to reflect on that a little bit, Annie? Mm. I think this is a hugely um, important and difficult question. Um, and I, I don't know how much it applies to, I, I suppose it applies to us everyone, but I, I could say that in Helsinki and in Finland in general, I think in the culture of civil service, there's a really big role in being afraid uh, of mistakes and mistakes being sort of uh, revealed or going public. So also a little bit why the bureaucracy is there. To prevent yeah, yeah, the yeah. mistakes from and happening, right? And of course, right? the sort of um, perhaps more positive thing, uh, which also um, touches these uh, issues, is the really strong willingness of being really equal and treating everyone basically the same, which is a good thing also. But of course, it um, uh, it uh, it also makes it harder to be creative or be innovative or to start new processes. I think I had really a nice short discussion um, with the person who's responsible for giving um, uh, building permits, the, the section that uh, deals with building permits. And we, had, we have had a really long project, uh, one block in a, one of the new areas, uh, where there was a pilot project of building the whole block from wood. Um, although Finland has a lot of forest, we actually do not build, uh, it, it's not that one, oh. yeah. Uh, it's a different example. The, this is a successful thing, but that was really a sort of um, a, a house of uh, apartment house. And during the construction, uh, they have tried and they had given a permission uh, to build from wood, not covering the whole site but actually letting the rain come in if it rains, um, and they had a sort of process how it should actually then dry. But there were really significant um, problems with the site, and the site was not managed uh, um, properly enough. And um, we had come um, to a meeting in the Ministry of Environment where the uh, uh, chief civil servant from the ministry had invited all the private sector companies who had worked with that and us as a city um, representatives to be responsible that why are there these failures. And when we went out, uh, this Mr. Miller said to me that why is it so that always in speeches uh, you are encouraged to try out new things and say that you can also fail? But I have never seen a situation when actually you do fail and then someone <laughs> would thank you. And I think it, it's, a, it's a super big thing that, um, that how actually in real practice uh, to, uh, to uh, encourage uh, encourage that kind of culture because we actually deal with people, uh, real people who are also citizens are angry if things do not go well. So, so I think that at least what it requires is really strong and committed leadership uh, in order for the whole machinery of the city to feel that they can also speak up uh, of the things that have not gone right. Perfect. And uh, regarding the library, uh, it's perhaps more positive example. If we have time, I, I will go to it as well. Okay. Thank you, Lorenzo. 
How is that for you? Uh, well, I think in this field we need uh, to experiment very much. So we, we uh, started uh, um, to uh, set up an online platform. Uh, we had the new regulations. Uh, we opened the new spaces. And then we asked the uh, people on the ground to be activators or facilitators of these processes. And then we had a call for proposals. Uh, so we, we asked the people to propose uh, us uh, uh, something to do. And and then to evaluate it uh, before to uh, come to a, a new regulation on this shared administration we would like to have uh, uh, examples to show to everybody on what is possible to do with this system and so uh, we started uh, trying to uh, collect experience and to try uh, whether these experiences uh, were had an impact on the territory and we um, show um, that the experience showed us that uh, there is a high impact if you have uh, activators uh, on the ground and uh, uh, we had uh, not only some uh, um, great example of uh, urban renovation with new squares, uh, uh, garden maintenance, uh, cleaning uh, houses, but also new services. So uh, a cultural of valorization uh, of uh, something that uh, we had there but uh, wasn't uh, uh, valorized. Like uh, Let's say open data. I I'm dealing with the, with data and the administration, the valorization of open data of the municipality was made with the community uh, working on this for transparency. And so we uh, used the experience of some people to help us to show whether the projects were going good or not. And uh, that was uh, a way of involving different kind of people. And did it, did it uh, show together. some fuck ups? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes. Probably. <laughs> okay, probably. Good. <laughs> good. 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 So that's actually going back to the the issue of permeability of the system that we were talking about uh, this morning as well. Um, so I have one uh, final question for new, now for all of you, because we've seen the successful example of, of the city of Madrid being quite complete in their progressive strategy around uh, new types of governance, but then the elections came a couple of weeks ago, and. Um, so you can also still say that these sort of bureaucratic systems that were put in place after a new progressive uh, leadership was taking place in the city, right after the elections, and they've been replaced right now for, uh, for a much more right-wing government, um, it's a, it's a matter, it's, it's a question whether these, these systems are resilient enough within the four years that they've been, that they've been in, taken in place. So how do you make sure that these... These things are a little less about your political leadership and that they are embedded as enough in the system that they are resilient to political changes in the future. Can you uh, mm -hmm. share well, your thoughts on that? Well, I think that the, 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 the change in, in, in the way the institutions work, uh, the, the, the change is inevitable. Uh, so in a sense, I think that we only might work at, as accelerators. Uh, and I know that, for example, Madrid and Barcelona, th th they had huge accelerations. Uh, but the change is, is, is inevitable, because if, if the institutions don't, uh, don't, don't change themselves and don't, don't uh, comply, uh, then there will be all kinds of other problems. So uh, the, the, the question is, what we are seeking, I think, is, an, is in a sense a non-political issue. Uh, is an issue about the effectiveness of government uh, and the effectiveness of, uh, of, 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 of uh, how to run a society, as a city, for example. So in a sense, I think, yes, it can have a huge backlash with another, uh, with another um, um, political uh, scenery, but uh, I think that change is inevitable. Uh, and especially cities, I think, uh, should, be, um, should, should take the lead, and there are quite happily, uh, uh, still en enough cities that, that are looking for, uh, for these change. For example, Barcelona seems a bit, uh, a bit disappointing, but Barcelona and Comu is back in office. So that's, that's great. Uh, uh, and, and I think that in, in, in strengthening a European network of cities seeking this change in local government, that will, that will be effective. Good. Mm. <laughs> Again, I, I think a super difficult question, actually, and um, Sorry. I would um, uh, I would um, approach it uh, from um, from one perspective, uh, that is the climate action needed, uh, and um, I think that the climate action also uh, 
it's a good examples where you need citizens, you need citizens participation, ideas, uh, willingness to do changes in their individual behavior and uh, also in their collectives, be it uh, housing companies or be it neighborhoods and so on. But also I think climate action is something that needs at the moment so many changes in so many fields uh, in such a short time that it's um, in a way inevitable that there's also backlash or at least sort of a backlash uh, voicing of we don't want that, we want our diesel cars to exist there and this is taking our identity, these sort of uh, things that you are pushing. And I think in a way it's... Um, um, in Helsinki we have a um, coalition government uh, tradition so uh, no change is really abrupt in a way but, but I think it's a real risk that uh, the change needed in material terms regarding reducing the CO2, it needs so many changes that I think that the situation can be that people just get tired of these uh, changes and um, then I think that uh, in a way, perhaps a change uh, in the long run is in inevitable that people do want to participate and uh, so on. But I, I think that in a way participation and people's own voices getting stronger, um, it's not inevitable that it will lead to progressive direction. It, it can in a way, lead to many directions. Yeah, yeah. so there's also no co-creation without pushback and without going back and forth and some serious rambling. Lorenzo, your, your uh, last well, remarks? Yeah, uh, administration change quite fast, uh, but uh, I think the point is cultural change, and that is uh, very slow, and that is slow when you try to introduce a new uh, point of view, a new way of administration, and uh, uh, that's bad when you try and you push. But once uh, you uh, arrive uh, at the point and uh, uh, the people and the public functioners start a, a new way of uh, uh, working together, I think that is uh, quite uh, irreversible. So uh, that stay, even if the administration will change afterwards, because they uh, realize that it's good to work together. We we um, we had this experience with the participatory budgeting that was good uh, with an online platform, but the the core business was not the, the online platform, but the relationship we started to have between uh, the people on the ground asking for uh, new projects uh, and public works uh, and the funds functioners. So they both uh, uh, learned something uh, from the other side. Uh, the, the, the people started understanding how complex it is to administrate a town with all the regulation and uh, the complexity of public works. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the public functioners uh, understand how is uh, high the, the level of experience that people uh, has in, all, uh, in, in, in their territory. Uh, they perfectly know not only the needs but uh, also uh, the, the, their own territory where they be, where they live in. So um, this is, uh, I think, something that they will bring uh, for the rest of the time in, in which they will be active citizens uh, inside the administration or uh, or not. Good. Thank you so much for your on like your honest sharing and also showing some vulnerability and also the sharing the hopes for the for the future. And uh, I want to give a big round of applause to Annie Sinemakri, Rutger Groot Wassink, and Lorenzo Liparini. So, ooh, are you okay? Yeah? <laughs> we need you the coming uh, three years, Rutger. Please uh, stay with us, okay. So, uh, and then. Right before we move into the lunch break, I would love to have the people that are involved in the uh, afternoon sessions with me to really, really briefly pitch what we're going to do and what we're going to delve deeper into uh, this afternoon. So can I have with me Mike Brandjes, Jasper Etta, Indy Joar, are you still here? Yes, you're there. And Ekim Tan, Jeske van Oosten and Nazanin Herayati. So I'm going to start, yes, welcome. I'm going to start with you because we haven't seen you before on the stage. What are we going to do this afternoon? Jetske, you want to start first? Yeah, yeah that's okay. 
Uh, we're going to look at city making from a more international perspective and also talk a little bit more about the sustainability of city making. I work at the Creative Industries Fund and I will be talking also about a new learning course, this time not for city makers but for uh, municipalities. Um, that get the opportunity actually to learn for, from uh, known city makers and designers how to uh, embed actually this new way of working um, in their uh, own activities. Um, for more information come to the about this, come to the session or read the flyers and Ekim will tell you more about the international perspective. Yeah, I think that was the slide for Jetske actually. So the, the what what you are just saying, working it differently. So Anders Werken, uh, Anderstad, uh, Dorp, and Land. And then if you can move to the next slide, you will see. Yeah, I think that. Well, I think the the former name of the program that Jetske is talking about for City Labs. I think there are more than 50 uh, active City Labs all over the country. And as a gaming company, I'm from Play the City, we have been working since four or five years in a couple of Dutch uh, city lab contexts, which eventually we decided to uh, test it in Turkey, in, in Mersin, in a Mediterranean city south of Turkey, uh, where you see that um, in, in the last one year we have been bringing uh, NGOs, uh, academics, and uh, well, city makers, different communities together to set up something like this. Of course, the challenge is big. We don't have the structures and all the funding possibilities in Turkey, but there is a need. And there's a need because there's so much more centralization going on. And, and the, on the local level, you see the civil rights movements are, are becoming more and more active and, and actually needing the space to move on in this construct. So what we will be discussing in the afternoon is basically looking at what are the possible constructs in context that such constru construction doesn't exist. And then we are, I think we have Dutch examples. We are starting with uh, three examples uh, from the Netherlands. Binghorst, uh, uh, Reynard, uh, and uh, am I right in uh, saying uh, <laughs> Reynard <laughs> in Rotterdam, and Apollo Beard and Bakshatram in Amsterdam. And then uh, the mayor of Mesitli from Mersin will be with us, uh, and, and, and our partners, Nida and Aitje, the, 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 basically the leading partner doing the uh, city lab in Mersin, and then we will be discussing and comparing two systems. Hello. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so this is the the City Labs local action or international movement that is going to take place yeah. here upstairs, and it's starting a bit later than the other session. So if you do this one, you'll have a little bit of a longer break, but you'll start at 2:30. So thank you, Akim and Jeska. Uh, so then next up, Mike Branches. We've been seeing you this morning, but what are we going to do this afternoon? Uh, together with uh, Manu Klaas from Antwerp, we're going to the K Zone, and I think we're going to have a discussion which we already had on the podium a little bit, but we can continue the discussion. We've seen a number of things that are happening, but what are the overarching items, the learning effects? And we hope to have a discussion with all of you who also are active in all sorts of areas. So that we can bring to the table, how do we move forward in the co-creation area between government and civil active citizens, etc. So you're welcome to come. There's a metro, it still runs all the way. So that's good. So it's an easy one, and I think Max is the one that's taking everyone. Yeah, so if you want to join this, uh, this amazing workshop, you have to be in about 12 minutes. You have to be downstairs if you want to join the travel. Uh, if you want a bike, that's also fine. But at 12.40, Max van der Ploeg is going to take you all the way to the K-Zone. So make sure to gather downstairs in front of the building. And then in the Joar. Well, um, what we'd like to be looking at is some of these kind of civic financing. So your civic ideas, how do we actually finance them and structure them in new ways? And what is a value model? So exploring actually and developing these would be really great fun. So what, what would be brilliant is if you have some crazy ideas that you'd like to think about, and let's all come together and start to imagine the different ways of organizing and structuring them. So we'll, that's probably the key from my side. Thank you so much. And then last but not least, Jasper Etten. Oh, sorry. So this, yeah, great. This one is also up here in the studio at 1.30. All right. And the last one will be the breakout together with Charles Landry. Uh, so it will be about uh, uh, creative bureaucracy, difficult world, word. And, uh, uh, and we will connect that to the streets of Amsterdam and uh, the initiatives of Amsterdam. And it will all be about, and this is another difficult word for me to say, but a strategy. 
uh, strategy. Uh, uh, and so a strategy about how can we get these worlds together uh, in, a, in a positive way, in a productive way. And this will be at the NEMO. Yeah, absolutely. So a change is going to come workshop on creative and civic public collaboration with Charles and Jasper and the whole the social pact team. Uh, that's going to start at 1.30 as well uh, at the NEMO Science Center. Again, if you would like to join the walk, please make sure to be here downstairs at 1.15 because then you'll go there collaboratively and that's what we want anyway. So everything is about collaboration. Okay, so with that, I would love to invite you all to go to lunch and enjoy your workshops this afternoon.